can't eat either of them. Dr. Paknikar, Dr. Bappert, while we set up things, um, let me just say that this is an extreme delight for me to be here. This is my first visit to Agarkar Institute. And from what I have seen, uh, it's doing exceptional work uh, considering the size of the institute. I mean, it's not as large as a university. And even then, it's able to contribute. It's contributing certainly very, very strongly to the chosen areas of research, going from fundamental uh, to very applied, uh, going all the way to commercialization. Uh, so there's certainly a, a very model template uh, for any research institute. In fact, very few institutions are able to follow uh, some like that. Uh, people are either good at very fundamental research or good at very applied, uh, very commercial research. Uh, but to have a seamless going from fundamental to applied to, to commerce, uh, that's rather rare. So, so I have to uh, really say, uh, you know, how great it really is and how d delightful it is uh, to be in a place like that. Of course, today is Founders Day, uh, which is Professor Agarkar. We heard about him, his contributions. Uh, Founders Day is not only to recall the great contributions, but also to have some take home messages from there. I was looking up Wikipedia uh, to look up about Professor Gharkar. Uh, so one of the things that struck me, uh, he completed PhD during World War I in jail uh, in a foreign land in Germany, right? So, you know, it can't get any harder than that. Uh, the point is, that we can turn around adversity uh, even in some strength. Uh, it's now much use complaining about when things are not going well, uh, but you know one can certainly by will, by hard work, by staying there, by positivity, it is possible to forge ahead. And I think that's the message that basically I learned by looking at his life, which always remains uh, 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 it always remains relevant, it remains contemporary. Going from World War I to now, uh, the, our problems, they don't really change very much, even though technology changes, but the people, their problems, their fears, their hopes, they remain the same. And so, you know, that our pioneers, the way they have shown us, uh, you know, setting up institutions that even today flourish, uh, after 50 years, uh, that's, that's a great thing to learn, uh, both for young, old, and middle-aged people. So thank you very much again for inviting me here. Um, great delight indeed. What I want to do is, if I can open this. Hopefully, Pune 1 is the right presentation here. I got one more in Pune today. So uh, I think that this should be all right. What I want to talk about is not about deep science, uh, not about a particular area, because I'm not talking about biology. Uh, all of you know much better biology than I do. Uh, in any case, what's happening here? Oh, it's now opened it. It's about some general things about doing science. Uh, some of the things that uh, one learns after uh, doing a lot of things by some experience, by struggling a lot, and so on. Things that are not taught in textbooks. Um, but certainly as mentors, we ought to convey uh, that kind of stuff to our students, to our associates, whoever c we come in contact with. So one way, of course, that we do science is by very deep learning, you know, these deep verticals of knowledge. Uh, and that's certainly the way to make progress in generating new knowledge. But there are a lot of things that happen. I mean, because when we, we do something for 30 years, uh, we often forget things which are commonplace. And that is very common. That happens all the time. Uh, so what I want to impress upon is not a particular area of science, uh, but 
you know, if we, if we do a little bit of commonsensical thinking, then often time many things get resolved. Okay, so I just want to give a few examples of that from my own personal experience uh, and say, look, um, I know, I mean, over the years I, I taught in IIT Kanpur about quarter century before moving to Delhi. Uh, so the students who are, who are very, very intelligent can crack very big exams, very complicated exams, but often we lose common sense. Uh, so you people would design a distillation column uh, based on very complex calculations, which has a diameter of six inches and goes all the way to the moon. And people would not actually stop, think, and make a comment about it. Okay, it's, it's basically what comes out is, you know, we say, all right, I mean, that's what it is. And we, we don't really examine things uh, as a, even a, a, a lay scientist. Other thing, you know, because I'm not talking about biology and any of those things here, what I have found is, of course, you learn one kind of thing talking to people who are like, like you. I mean, they work in the same area, they have same experience, they have same background. One learns more and more of that by talking to those people. But it's often much more important to talk to people who do not share the same background as us, because one can learn much more. One can learn things that we didn't know before. Uh, so it's always more delightful actually to, to talk at length, to try to understand some other area. Uh, and then uh, it's even possible to make rapid contributions in that area because of a new perspective uh, that a person brings by not working in that area for a long time. Um, so first thing I tell my PhD students, everybody who would listen to me or not listen to me, he said, look, um, before you start doing anything, let's be clear. Do not believe anything that anybody says. And of course, this, I'm rephrasing what Buddha said. He, he said, believe nobody, no matter who said it, no matter if I said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense and experience. And this, well, the same thing, the motto is translated a Royal Society motto, which basically says, take nobody's word for it, right? So this is the first principle of doing science. Uh, it's not about authority. Authority is good. And so oftentimes, students would come to me and say they have read 20 papers in this area, and they, well, they start believing everything which is in those papers. Uh, but if one does that, then one would only make incremental additions to the knowledge. Uh, in order to be uh, able to do something more disruptive, something more profound, it's best actually n not to believe anything, and you uh, apply your own mind, maybe a fresh perspective uh, would evolve from there. Another, the second point about doing science, indeed, is if we have found that something has been proved by 10 different ways, uh, it's not much point actually proving it again 11th way or 12th way. Uh, it's much better actually to look at conditions where uh, it does not apply. And so find, uh, focus on weakness rather than strength, uh, very simply put. Uh, so these are the two, two things. These are obvious things. I mean, if you think about it, but they are much harder to put in practice. Uh, and I have found it extremely difficult to, to convey not this as a philosophy, but as a practical thing, as an operational aspect of how we want to do science. So I make a quick connection with, uh, well, in doing science, what is the role of lateral thinking, creativity, common sense? What is creativity? A lot of people ask, well, what is creativity? I don't know what the creativity is. Uh, however, the way I look at it, today is modern science. It is all about connecting dots. Uh, the, the different, uh, the different um, uh, silos of knowledge which have not been connected before. So here is something happening in sociology, is something happening in chemistry. Uh, is there a connection between the two? So if these dots are very far from each other and they have not been connected before, you may call it multidisciplinary, you can call it interdisciplinary, 
or you may call it out of disciplinary, uh, whatever you call it, the creativity today, much of it is, is not same as read, well, making something like E equal to MC squared or general theory of relativity, that space in science has shrunk a lot. Whole lot of that will never happen again. Uh, there is another kind of creativity which you may say well, Ramanujan's creativity uh, which is a singular point, that's a singular kind of creativity do not apply to most of us mortals. So beyond that what is the creativity that most of us can in fact share uh, and that has to do with the fact that we connect different dots of knowledge which are very far from each other and have not been connected before. Okay, so let's start with some examples uh, of common sense, of looking in a different way at science. Uh, the first example we are looking at is uh, connecting the dots which have not been connected before. Now one example, this is a story of scanning, tunneling, microscopy, atomic force microscopy. Basically what do they do? It's a microscopy, so you look at small things, you look at small things, uh, you know, picture of small things and nano things, micro things. Uh, so whenever we think about seeing, if we think about an image, we think about radiation, we think about light. So I say the way I see is by light. But is that the only way of seeing? I mean, you ask yourself a question, if I close my eyes or if I had no eyes or if I was blind, how would I see, right? So then one does not see through light one would see through touch, uh, right? So you take a stick and then you poke the stick here and walk and then you can get a visual map uh, of what you are seeing. Uh, if you convert that idea on a small scale, uh, which means your stick now is a little cantilever, a micro cantilever, So here uh, is a little, um, that's too far for a laser. So never mind, you see a small uh, stick, a cantilever, micro cantilever. And so if you go push against the surface and drag it and record the force or deflection of the stick, uh, then you can make a map of the surface. And in fact, you can do that with high precision uh, at nanometer scale. So this is how atomic force microscopy works. Uh, uh, one of the things that got about the fastest Nobel prizes uh, in physics, uh, so this uh, STM scanning tunneling microscopy together with atomic force microscopy, when you think about it, concept is very simple. He's saying, look, there's only not one way of seeing, but there are other ways of seeing that can be translated in technology, right? So now today actually, is the concept, new concepts that are important. Because if we have a good concept, it can always be translated in technology. Technology is not the limiting factor anymore. It is good ideas which are limiting factor. Now, we don't get good idea because we have been trained very hard. We have been trained in a very focused way. I mean, say, uh, well, this textbook, this chapter, this exam, this degree, right? So oh, there is no synthesis, there is no looking beyond uh, any of that. And so therefore we lose uh, new ideas, the new ways of thinking, uh, but that's where we need to tightly focus. Here's another example. This is about the story of graphene. Now, many of us know what graphene is. Basically, a two-dimensional sheet of carbon atoms. Right, so it's uh, one atom thick and a sheet of carbon atoms. And this, you know, it's a, it's a great material. Uh, there must be tens of thousands of paper using this material, graphene, even though it's relatively recent. Another material that got a very rapid Nobel Prize. And so the, the, what I want to illustrate with this story is in science, it is very important to see where is it that you focus. Now, if our focus is already determined, if we know, well, I, if I already expect an outcome from what I'm doing, then I would miss out everything else that goes on in between. And so this is what happens in most of the experiments. 
Um, here, so how do you make a layer of graphene or how do you isolate graphene? One of the ways to do that is you take a block of graphite, then put a tape on the surface of this block and then peel the tape. Because of weak cohesion between different carbon layers in graphite, you may be able to peel out uh, a graphene layer. Uh, given enough trials and given enough patience, uh, you would be, when you separate the tape from graphitic block, uh, then you would have a graphene layer uh, which is stuck onto the tape. So that is how mechanically graphene was first isolated, so it could be characterized electronically and so on. Um, so what is so great about this experiment? There's nothing great about this experiment except that the same experiment was being done for 50 years before graphene was isolated by this method. So what people were doing is, if you want to clean the surface of graphitic block, it's got dirt, it's got debris, you want to clean it, so you put the tape and then peel it so that you know all the debris, etc., goes on the tape and then you have a clean surface of graphite. So what people do is, I used to do it myself, uh, you know, so you, you throw away the tape and keep the graphitic block. In this case, the person threw away the graphitic block and kept the tape, right? So it's the same experiment. Question is, what is it that you learn from it? What is it that you retain? What is it that you throw away? And all of that has a very significant impact uh, on our way of doing science. So this is what happens. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example from my own experience. You see, serendipity is very important in science, which means chance. But chance would help only if we are prepared for it, so that if the chance throws up something, then I know what to make of it. So, you know, so it, it's not, uh, oftentimes students, I, I'm not criticizing students, by the way. Okay, make very sure that this is not the intent. I'm just giving example, and I'm saying students because we are starting out on this journey of discovery of science. Uh, and then we may not have the same maturity. And so I'm just illustrating the fact as to what these stages of learning are. Uh, starting, we are all students. And by the way, when I say uh, young people, I don't mean young people, we are all young, all right? Some are younger. I've never met an old person in my whole life, right? So it's just, you know, it's just relative, and I, I mean that. I don't mean it as anything bad. Um, so, you know, so students, they, they would often come and say, ah, this experiment doesn't work. Now, first thing you have to explain is that there is no such thing as a failed experiment. There is such a thing as failed theory. But experiment is a fact. This is what happens. And there is no such thing as saying, well, if I can't explain it, if I, this experiment is not giving me what I expected it should give me, then it's not a failed experiment. It's your failed expectation to match the experiment. And in fact, it's the failed experiments uh, which are most important because they would give us new lessons. And so here is an example without going into detail. We wanted to replicate the microstructure on shark's skin. Now, a shark skin is a very smooth thing, but on microscopic scale, it has all these protrusions, you know, very sharp protrusions coming out, and that's how the skin remains clean. Nothing really sticks to it. It's not because of the fear of shark, but, you know, even bacteria, they cannot cling to these surfaces, so they remain anti-fouling, they remain clean. We wanted to replicate this microstructure in a polymer, right, it, just to look at the properties. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by making a stamp and then pressing it on a block or a film of polymer. Soften polymer, then apply pressure, and just replicate these features. So, so that's the usual way that one does it. So here you see there is a stem going down on a polymer surface, and then it would create this microstructure that you see there, which is a triangular pyramidal the pyramids which are repeated over the entire surface, which is what you see in the right-hand corner there. So you make that a structure, which is fairly straightforward. It's a well-known technique of micro nano fabrication, okay, stamping. Uh, so you do the stamping 
and you create the microstructure. You see the triangular microstructure uh, that you see there, which is well and good, except that after some time, this structure breaks, uh, you know, starting from the top, it splits, the, the pyramid it splits into two parts. Uh, so that's what was happening in the experiments, and this, which made the student very desperate, uh, very uh, depressed for many months, but he'll not come back and tell me, he'll just keep telling me that the experiment doesn't work. And he'll throw away all these samples. So this is what, what was happening was like this. So you see that, that pyramids have split into two, starting from the top, and it has created a channel in between, right? So this is what he meant by failed experiment, because we wanted to make triangular structures, but after a while, it, it spontaneously transforms into this structure, which is undesirable from a student's perspective, right? Because that was not the goal that he had set up uh, for himself. But then, you know, when you look at this structure, he said, look, this structure, in fact, is more interesting than the one that we wanted to make, uh, because these are nano channels, you can make millions of nano channels in parallel uh, by this uh, self assembly or self organization now this happens because uh, when you stamp on polymer you create a sharp corner there are a lot of stresses at the sharp corner so they relax by forming a crack which is quite predictable and that crack goes down to the base uh, of the triangle and it makes a nano channel now if you wanted to make the same nano channel by what is called top-down methods, like focused ion beam, uh, those kind of stuff, then to make these would be very, uh, not easy, I mean, it take many hours of work, it requires a few million dollars worth of equipment uh, and a lot of patience, but in this case, you can, you can make it very easily, right? And of course, these nano channels can be used for many practical purposes. For example, uh, stretching out a big molecule you know, so it's flowing inside the channel, then while well, it would it stretch out so you can read it, for example, DNA. Uh, so without going into the details of that, what I want to illustrate is that we, you know, we, when we're doing something, we should be watching out for what is happening there rather than impose my own ideas and will on what ought to happen there. And then we, we find some new ideas, we find some new leads, and they may even be more useful than what I started out doing. So don't throw away samples. Uh, if things are not expected, then look probe more deeply. Of course, most of the time is some silly reason because of which it's not working. So, but beyond that, sometimes there are profound things that ought to be captured. Okay, uh, I'll tell you one example. You see, uh, so the, the way one does research is that one should have at least one or two problems in life uh, which are of long range interest, which is a very, uh, you know, larger question, so to say. Uh, not a specific question within a domain, but the larger domain. And one can continue with that question, that area for a very long time. Let's say three decades, four decades, whatever. The other kind of problems are what I call filler materials. Filler materials are to produce papers this year, and to have them publish, get your PhD, do whatever you want with it, right? We need to do both, okay? It's just uh, it's a, having a balance in life. He said there are uh, low-hanging fruits, so low-hanging fruits have to be picked up, but while doing that, one ought not to lose sense of a larger problem in life that gives satisfaction while pursuing it for a long time. Um, I'll give you a, a very um, limited example uh, so this is a problem that my group has been pursuing for a very long time, three decades, I would say. Uh, so I, after PhD, uh, right after arriving in Kanpur, which was 27 years ago, uh, we started working on this problem. Meanwhile, at least more than 50 groups around the world for the last five decades have also pursued uh, this problem and still pursuing. So what is the problem? So problem is like this. It is related to self-organization. What is self-organization? So, well, there are two different ways you can look at things. The first one we know, self-assembly. Self-assembly is small things coming together to make something larger, right? So molecules or small particles and so on, basically driven by chemistry, oftentimes, maybe driven by van der Waals, non-specific interactions, but also by specific interactions. 
And so the domain of chemistry is about the length scale of structures that one makes is about a nanometer to 100 nanometers. Now, another thing is what I call self-organization, which is driven more by physics. Now, what is self-organization? Well, you, you may make something simple, a simple shape, like a plane. And because the shape, if it is unstable, it will change spontaneously into something more complex. Uh, so it is not self-assembly, it's not, you are not assembling small bits of matter, but you are starting with uh, one, uh, one object. Uh, that object may be simple to begin with, so it's easy to make it, but after a while it changes into something more complex. If I understand this process of change, then I can control it. And if I can control it, then I can make something useful uh, with it. So this self-organization is what, what basically I'm saying uh, is, uh, uh, is transformation of a simple object into a complex object by changing the shape. And that happens because the initial object I made is unstable. So it's trying to reduce its energy and that process is undergoing shape changes. Now, when you do self-organization on very small scale, which means make a very small object, like a very thin film. Suppose you make a thin film, which is 10 nanometer thick, 5 nanometer thick, is highly confined, and I will show you it is unstable. So it would change. So when you do this on very small scale, then um, the, the object which comes out of it is typically has dimensions of micron. So, you know, I will show that also. And the reason for that is, that when you deform something, when you change the shape, you increase the area. When you increase the area, the surface tension, you know, surface energy of the system increases. So you have to put in a lot of work in that system uh, in order to increase the area. When you do it on a small scale, uh, then because you don't have that much work available per unit area, uh, so the deformation is on a large scale, a micron scale, but not nanometer scale. In other words, if you take a surface and you create a dent in it, every nanometer, it will require a lot of energy from outside, right? Uh, and, and focused energy on that point. So because that doesn't happen, so, so basically you create a surface which is undulating on micron scale rather than nanometer scale. So question now is, how can we bring the scale of, of uh, self-organization, how do we bring it to the scale of self-assembly? Can we make these two processes look the same? Now, these two processes would start looking the same if there was no surface tension in this world. Other words, when things get small, they look more like surface rather than volume, right?